Welcome to Why I Hate Your Podcast. These days, there are a lot of podcasts to choose from. This is another one. I'm Crystal, and each week my brother Sean and I meet up to talk about two podcasts and why we hate them, or don't. Join us and we might help you find your new favorite podcast, or save you from wasting time on a podcast you might hate. All right, our first podcast today is called Young and Hung. The hosts are Griffin Johnson and Bob Minnery, and it's actually produced under Bob Minnery's Productions. So it's it's an independent network, but it's owned by Bob Minnery, I presume. So the host, Griffin Johnson, he is a 21-year-old TikTok phenomenon, and Bob Minnery is a comedian who specializes in R-rated sports commentary, which is a thing. We'll explain a little later. Uh, and it's basically... Well, it's purported to be an interview show, interviewing guests kind of ranging across all kinds of industries. So in the few episodes I've listened to, and it is a fairly new podcast, I should say, but in the few episodes I've listened to, investment specialists, social media, e-boys, it's really kind of, I don't know how to define what their interview subject kind of theme is, if there is a theme. I don't think there is one. So it's new. There's not a ton of episodes. We were, this is actually a requested podcast, and so neither of us have listened to this before listening to it specifically for the review. And I'm going to start out by saying that there's a big age difference between the two hosts. So the one I said is 21-year-old, Bob Minnery. I don't know how old he is. I'm guessing he's in his mid mid to late 30s. I think in one of the episodes, one of the episodes I listened to, he mentioned he was like in his uh, like 34 or something. Okay, yeah, that's about what I expected. He emphasizes a lot during their discussions that there's an age difference here. And before I go any further, because I have a lot of thoughts here, what was your first impressions? Like, what did you expect going into this? Because for me, I wasn't really sure what to expect. And I think I kind of got a little bit of what I expected and a lot of what I didn't. So what what were your expectations going into this? I, I I didn't really have any expectations because of one I've never heard of these two people before this, uh, mm-hmm. and I, I just had no idea who they were, and so I didn't understand the context. And like you said, there's a big age gap. Which and the thing is, I got to give some credit the fact that you have two people who are completely different. I feel like so you mm, know, Griffin is young. He seems like he's kind of. Uh, I've actually gone to his TikTok page, a lot of shirtless photos. He's kind of like one of those TikTok, you know, hottie stars or whatever. Um, e-boys yeah Yeah, e-boy yeah yeah. so and then bob is like this dude bro sports guy right and (laughs) and so they're just completely different people although i will say that bob probably has his mind is probably the age of a 22 year old so maybe that's not so different that Um, you might be being generous yeah yeah exactly i also will say just uh, (laughs) so i think my guess is that they didn't really know each other that well i think this is sort of a and there weren't like fr- this is not a situation where there were friends before and they decided to start a podcast. This was sort of a contrived my impression. And I'm pretty confident in it is it was a kind of a contrived because I think in the very first episode or the trailer, maybe it was it was like a, a pre trailer was like 20 minutes long. There's it sounds like they're trying to get to know each other like they right. don't really know each other that well. Right. Yeah. And and it's also that they come from totally different backgrounds because I think both of them are kind of viral stars. Right. So. Griffin mm. became a viral TikTok sensation, apparently. I, I don't keep up with that culture, but from a little bit of research I did. And uh, Bob, he was just a regular dude who just happened to have gone viral with his R-rated sports casting, uh, which kind of mm-hmm. led him to be, be some celebrity. So they're both kind of social media uh, stars, in a way, or viral mm-hmm. stars, uh, who've been able to successfully capitalize on it, which i got to give him credit for that, right? Right. Because Griffin, apparently, he's got two other uh, podcasts, uh, Sway Way, which I don't know what that's about, and then Brand Aid, uh, which apparently he is pretty savvy when it comes to marketing, and he does use his TikTok money for, uh, he's an angel investor, a uh, venture capitalist, so he uses his money to save brands or do other things, and, and, and in a weird sort of way, I would be kind of interested in listening to Brand Aid, because I think it's all more about that marketing and branding stuff, uh, because I mean, if you think about it, to be a successful TikTok star, there there is a you have to have a certain level of acumen when it comes to branding, right? Uh, yeah, it's a success- business now. Yeah, it's a business, so you have to give credit where credits due uh, to a degree, even though it's TikTok, which I find insufferable. But if people can be popular and successful on it, and they know how to do it properly, then you know more power to them. Um, right. 
so whereas Bob, I think he, he's gotten some deals with like, he, and he has another podcast too called Zapped, which I, I don't know anything about that one. Maybe it's something we'll review in the future, but it, you know, he, he kind of does a lot of sports related stuff, right? It seems like, and he's done some voice acting as well from what I could tell, which he does have a great voice. He sounds like, uh, I don't know if you've ever seen the show Archer. He sounds like Ar- the Archer, the, the actor who plays Archer is uh, John <laughs> Benjamin. So he sounds very similar to him. To me, he sounds like every like ESPN, the kind of the high level ESPN sports announcers. Like he sounds like, and that's what his thing is, right? That was his shtick. I think that got him right. kind of famous was was that whole that way his voice sounds, and he's very into sports. Like he clearly pays attention yeah. to sports. Yeah, and and the interesting thing is though is that his speaking voice, like his conversational voice, is very different from his. It's almost kind of like, you know, newscasters always have that newscaster voice. Yeah, like a radio uh, DJ. Uh, yeah. The, with their non-regional. Yeah, yeah. Their non-regional diction. And he kind of has, he kind of puts on a character when he's doing his R-rated sports cast. But when he's just talking as just a regular guy, you know, his voice is a little different. Yeah. So I put together uh, a handful of clips from his Instagram posts um, where he's doing the sports casting, the R-rated sports casting, just to kind of illustrate how funny he is in what he has gone viral for and what he really does best. Um, and just a note, I did add the censoring beeps. That is not part of the original. You can go to his Instagram to see what uh, what his original uh, clips sound like. And I do recommend it because they are hilarious. And coming in untouched like a f-ing freight train, number 72 is lost in space. He's like Helen Keller. He can't see. And down goes Newton. The heater might be over. Game very one-sided here. And this one is going to come to an end. But 88. Oh, God. He's going to storm and bulldoze the referee. High school kid talking about the balls on this guy. He's already showing signs of trouble as he comes in like a bull in a f***ing china shop and runs down the referee. And I want to see what the penalty is going to be for this. This might just eliminate them from the playoffs for good as 88 f***s everything up for the team. Now the Eagles have a little momentum now. Extra point from Elliott, you f***ing Excuse my language, but that was horrific. Peter and I once in a while dabble in gambling, and that just f***ed us. The score is 14-6 to and half. Great kick, Jake. But we haven't really talked about the content of their podcast yet. And so my first note, my first two notes that really struck out to me was the intro was super loud, but even though it was very short and the sound quality is garbage, absolute garbage for people who do other podcasts. This sounds like this was recorded in an empty room that has like a drywall in it. So it's just the sound is echoing everywhere. It's absolute garbage. Like they're recording with like their iPod headphones. It's it. I'm very disappointed by sound design uh, for people who already have other podcasts. Well, not only that, but they they both make their their living via social media social media vehicles. So that it's like one of them is a TikTok, uh, uh, one of the highest rated TikTok personalities, and the other one is his thing is his voice. That's his thing. That's mm-hmm. his shtick. And so, yeah, I, I I was I was kind of surprised by that as well that the production quality was so low. And I don't want to judge small podcasts for terrible sound quality because I mean, let's be honest, we're recording in very basic equipment ourselves. But it feels like the you know this is from a, 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 an official production label, right, from Bob Minery. And they both make their money in a, I mean, TikTok's a little different because it's mostly cell phone video, let's be honest. But like Bob Minery, that's his thing. He's he's supposed to sound like he's in this. And honestly, his Instagram videos where he's doing his R-rated sports commentary has better audio quality than this podcast. Yeah, yeah. No, I agree. Uh, one of the episodes I listened to, it's literally, it sounded like there was a microphone right in the center of the room. And it was an empty room with nothing <laughs> on the walls. So the sound bounces everywhere. And they were on the opposite ends of the room, <laughs> yeah. right? Which, and that really annoyed me. Now I can give some, I can give some leniency to their interviews, which sounds like it's a Skype call. Which in today's society, a lot of time people are doing things right. via Zoom or right. Skype and stuff. So I, I can understand if the guest is not in the yes. studio, their sound quality may not be the best. So I can give a pass to that. But them being in one room with one microphone, it just at least that's what it sounded like. The sound quality was just absolute yeah. garbage. Yeah, I agree. So my first note. And, and I want to get into this because to me, this was the most off-putting thing about the podcast. And there's a lot that's off-putting. But to me, hmm. Bob Minery, he comes across as really freaking creepy. He's, yes. oh, so, so he's in his 30s. This kid's 21. 
and the percentage of time that the episodes I listened to were focused on him grilling this kid about his sex life and how much how much yep. poontang he's getting was to like it wasn't just locker room like hey God, you know it was creepy old guy trying to identify with the sex and like he focuses so much on this and there was an episode I don't know which episodes you listened to, but I think the first episode was sort of a tra- slash trailer. It, I don't know what you would call it. It was supposed to be a trailer, but it's almost like 20 minutes long. And it's literally most of it is him trying to like grill this 20 year old on who he slept with, what other TikTok celebrity he slept with. He slept with. And one of them, like he keeps referencing this one particular TikTok star. I don't know anything about TikTok, so I'm completely. But he keeps referencing her. And then the one guy's finally like the 21 year old is like, She's like 16, dude, or whatever. She was clearly underage. He's like, oh, maybe it's not her. I don't know. He just came across as really (laughs) freaking creepy and way obsessed about how much sex this, you know, Griffin Johnson guy was getting. And then the second episode, I think it was the second one, they basically, and and you mentioned he, you mentioned this when it comes to Griffin Johnson. He's got like a separate TikTok channel for the, or, or company or whatever, the Sway thing. So apparently it's a house full of, so some rich mansion they bought oh. and it's a house full of other TikTokers and they call it the Sway house yeah, or something. I don't know. Yeah, that that's actually a common thing in, in both like TikTok. I think it started uh, with and in Twitch. They, they I it, honestly think it started with. Um, well, it, they call it they call it an influ- God, What's his name? Um, the, the Paul brothers, Jake Paul. And like, I think that's where it started. Like they have yeah. a house full of a bunch of hangers on and fellow influencers, essentially. Yeah, yeah, that's they call them like influencer houses or something like that or streamer houses. So, and and really they're there just to cause drama. Yeah, to exactly. Because uh, except yeah. that the Griff, Griffin Johnson guy was like, no, no, I don't. We don't. We don't specialize in the drama. We try to be honest. Whatever. I'm sure. But when he had yeah. his buddies on from the Sway House, whatever. I I honestly can't even remember the guy's name. Again. A huge portion of the podcast was Bob Minery trying to get them to talk about how much sex they're having. It was gross and creepy and weird. I I don't understand why he's so obsessed with what's going on with these 21-year-old sex lives. I don't know if, I don't know. It just was really off-putting. I've actually put together a bunch of clips to kind of show this in action. This is from the trailer episode, which I, like I said, was about 20 minutes. And the second slash first episode, Kicking It With The Boys featuring Bryce Hall. So all of these clips are just from those two episodes for some context. Uh, what are your DMs like, truthfully? I probably should be thinking about settling down. I probably should. I'm hanging out with uh, these 20-year-old, 21-year-old TikTokers over at Saddle Ranch. Who's the most known arrival girl you've ever hooked up with? You can't plead the fifth on this. This is not an interview. This is uh, our podcast. You can't uh, plead the fifth, bro. Dude, come on, Bob. No, this is, hey, listen, this is your little fucking 12-year-old girl clickbait here or whatever it is. I mean... But who uh, are some of the people that you know, that like everybody knows that you hooked up with, like, like on the internet? I'm scared. Why? Dude. This is just... Nobody's going to hear this. Come on, just tell us. Nobody's listening to our nobody's, show. Nobody's listening at all. No. This is going to be posted on uh, every every site in the entire world. Are you like are you willing to like drink during this podcast at all? Because I was gonna say we could have like you can pass dude. three times, but you're taking a shot every time you pass. <laughs> like we're not being pussies on this show, dude. I'm I'm saying everything. I'm you're ta- saying okay. So who's the most no- notoriable girl you fucked up with? Instagram model number twenty seven. I don't know. I don't. Nobody really cool at all. Yeah, uh, same. I think I think like people would probably know the answer to this without me saying it. So just tell me if people already know. That's how much I know about this stuff. Who gets more pussy out of you two? Probably Griff. <laughs> really? No way. Girl, who's the hottest girl you ever hooked up with? I'm not gonna say that, bro. Listen to me. I follow your shit. I see the chicks you fuck with, and I'm secretly jealous. <laughs> and the, the reason why you're in here is I need to know your secrets. Who's the oldest chick you ever hooked up with? Oh, he's hooked up with moms. Are you kidding me? Shut up. <laughs> I don't even know the answer to that. Really, I don't. <sighs> All right. I actually don't know. I mean, but did she look really f***ing old when you hooked up with her? Like, could you guess? Yeah, that's true. It's like, when- it's like I don't ask Grace. She's got like, maybe like walking in. Maybe like high 30s. Well, and the thing is, is that Bob, he's definitely a dude bro frat boy who never left that age, right? So he's still at the college campus in the sorority house or the frat house, uh, just, you know, drinking and, and slaying the ladies or whatever. <laughs> and that that's that's his life. Uh, that's his entire life. And his 
C-list celebrity status kind of allows him to continue living that life. And and to be fair and to be honest, I mean Griffin Johnson, if you look at his TikTok, it's you know it's that e boy highly sexualized right, stuff. Right, of right, of course. So he's already setting the precedence that he's like some you know hot body twenty one year old and stuff. So naturally, you know that's why people watch his TikTok. And so Bob's would be like, okay, well, you know, if you're this hot, you know, TikTok star, then how many women have you slept with? You must be getting a ton of, Um, yeah. And so, yeah, yeah. It's almost like, it feels like Bob's probably jealous. That's exactly what I got. Like the vibe, the vibe I got uh, was he's, he's trying to get this information out of this 21 year old because he's not getting that kind of, you know, action anymore. And he like wants to hear about it. It's like, get his jollies off. I don't know. It was so gross and creepy. Yeah. He's. He's living. He's living vicariously yeah. through him. Yeah, basically. exactly. And he wants. And he specifically was asking, "Well, what's the most famous person you've slept with?" And the and, and to give Griffin credit, I mean, I don't know anything about this twenty-one-year-old TikTok guy, but he was like, "I'm not going to say that." You know, he kept trying to play it off, and and you know, it'd be one thing if Bob asked that question and he sort of laughed it off, and I'm not going to say, but he kept grilling him, like, "Please, like, tell me." I must know it, to the point where it got awkward and uncomfortable because I don't think, like I said, I think the important thing to note here is these guys were not friends before they started this podcast. From what I can tell, their interaction feels very much like they were put together for the purpose of making a podcast. And and maybe Bob Minery had followed him and he's like, hey, I've got this great idea. Here's the concept. But it just the amount of time that Bob Minery focuses on sex I, I walked away from right. it going, I feel dirty. It, well, and, it, and, it, and possibly maybe it's a way that they're capitalizing off, you know, Griffin's, you know, quote unquote sex appeal or whatever, because again, I think that's why Griffin is popular in TikToks because, you know, he's like. Oh, some, sure. I mean, he's really handsome and he's, you know, he's got a nice body or whatever. And he's like, well, like you said, most of his TikToks, I, I looked at a few as well. He's, you know, shirtless. He's clearly supposed to be some sort of sex icon on TikTok. For 21 year olds yeah <laughs> and and you know what's funny is that here you have you know this 21 year old whose tiktok is you know very sexualized mm-hmm. even if it, it maybe it's subtle to it's subtle sexual you know sexualized subtly but mm-hmm. there was actually one of the episodes where bob had asked because there's there's a famous meme online it's like who would you marry have sex and kill oh yeah yeah and they and you list three people yes. right and he asked that, but with like other podcasters or influencers and stuff like that. And one of them was actually Alexandria Cooper. Yes, which, I heard uh, that. I was like, hey, we know who yeah, that is. Yeah, <laughs> and, and, and Griffin was just like, really? He was kind of pushing back like, I don't want to do this. Right. Um, right. He was uncomfortable. Although it, it was interesting. It was interesting. And I would like to find out more information. But apparently uh, Griffin doesn't like barstool sports for some reason. Um, mm. So there might be some drama there. I don't know. He didn't really kind of elucidate a why, but... Apparently, he hates Barstool Sports, uh, which is where Alexandra's on. Yeah. But, I mean, Griffin was kind of really pushing back, like, eh, I don't want to do this. But Bob, like you said, he just kept pushing. And I was like, oh, gosh, this is so bad. And he was pushing in a way that was like, I think I'm funny. Ha, ha, ha. But it was right. so aggressive. Right. I just, yeah. It, there's a weird vibe. And I know people are going to listen to this and like, you guys are prudes. Listen to it and come back and tell me what you think because i promise well, you it comes off as super weird and creepy i can get sexual banner i can get locker room talk i don't have a problem with any of that but this was at a very weird level and the dynamic felt unnatural and just mm-hmm. that was my overall impression of the entire thing it was like oh god this is getting gross and what was interesting to me is that i didn't get that vibe i just got the vibe that this was just some dude bro who just like you know wants to hook up every other every other day right um, and he was just obsessed with sex, but I, now that you mention it and kind of thinking back, I could definitely see how you come out and saying, this guy is actually a little, a bit of a creepo. Right. Cause I mean, it, to your point, like it, I, I get the, the dude bro who can't get, and, and that absolutely is probably what he is. It's just, I'm still trapped in the frat boy age and I want to get back there. If anybody's listening to this, I'd love to get your opinions. If you listen to an episode or two, just to see what you think about it, because you know, I might be being hypersensitive, but it just feels a little bit off. And I think yeah. the problem is that they're not really friends. Like, or I shouldn't say not really friends. They're not people that have known each other a long time. If they'd known each other a long time, you know how when two people have kind of this ribbing dynamic 
or, you know, and I go back to something like last podcast on the left. I know you don't like that podcast, but the interaction between those guests or those hosts feels very natural. It feels, even if it's dumb and juvenile or, you know, sexual or whatever, it feels like these are guys that have known each other forever and they know like the buttons to push and they just know how to riff off each other. This feels like two guys that don't know each other and they're trying to or one of them, one of them is trying to fake that. I feel like Griffin half the time is like, okay, you know, like he wants to move on and get past out of the two. And that's the ironic thing to me. Out of the two, the 21 year old Griffin feels like the most mature. Yes. I actually have that as a point on here. I was like, uh, it, it, it hit the nail on the head. Uh, and again, I think because one, I think, and this is my theory, right? Because one, I don't know who this podcast is for, right? Because either. you got a sports guy, you got a e-boy TikTok star. I don't know the content. There is an interview each episode, mm-hmm. right? But in, the interviews don't really have a theme to them. Right. right. They just get, I think it's like whoever they can get. Because they've got like in one episode, it's a Z-list celebrity, a runner-up on The Bachelor, right? <laughs> um, or The Bachelorette or whatever. And then, uh, now they did have one with uh, the guy who killed Osama bin, La- bin Laden, which was actually, a, that was yes. actually a decent interview. Right. And Bob kind of runs the interviews for the most part, it seems like. Yes. Um, and it was actually a decent interview. I actually enjoyed that part of it. But I agree. Prior to the episode, though, they always kind of talk about, OK, what's the latest TikTok drama? Right. And then you have an interview with the next Navy SEAL killed Osama bin Laden. And I'm like, I, I don't know who, <laughs> yes. what I don't know who this is supposed to be for. So <laughs> part of me and the thing is, like I said, they've got other podcasts. Right. And yes. I definitely think that out of the two, that Griffin's probably the more internet famous, right? Or at least and internet more, successful. And the more savvy. Um, right. Exactly. More savvy. And mm-hmm. part of me is like, because there's there's no cohesiveness between these two. Why are these two together making a podcast other than the fact that somehow or another Bob convinced Griffin to do it so it can help Bob get more exposure? Right. right? And that's just a theory. I don't know if that's true. Right. Maybe maybe they are friends outside of this. Maybe they have known each other for a long time. I doubt it. Uh, but I don't think so. Right. And so I, I don't know. It's just, it, it's like oil and water. I don't know what they're trying to do together. And I don't know what the point of the podcast is other than interviewing Z-tier celebrities and talking about TikTok drama and how many women you sleep with. That That's, that's the podcast in a nutshell. It is. And I think, I think... My impression, again, totally guessing based on the interactions they've had, I think my impression is that Griffin Johnson thought this was going to be something else. And I don't think he's super comfortable with Bob Minnery's constantly grilling him about how much sex he's having. Yeah. It feels, he always feels reticent about commenting on that and answering Bob Minnery's questions. He's just, he's, I always feel like he's going, can we move on to the actual meat of the podcast? Yeah. And to your point, I think I think the interview with the, uh, the Navy SEAL, who was part of SEAL Team 6, that was really interesting. Totally interesting. And the, the second episode where they interviewed Gary um, Vaynerchuk, who's an investment, an angel investment specialist or whatever, and I think Griffin Johnson's been working with him as far as his investments go, was really, really interesting. And it kind of gave me some insight into some kind of interesting ways that that some of these young influencers are being smart about the they're being really smart and targeted about what they're doing, which it, it it's a little callous, right? You know, like it's not a natural, organic. Hey, I happen to be famous because I did some cool stuff on the internet. It's very strategic, and then they take the money they're getting and they're investing it, and they're they're being really financially smart. Like I get the impression this Griffin Johnson guy, he's not. He's not like a Jake Paul making money and then just flinging it everywhere. I think he actually has a really good strategic financial plan. And this kid's really smart. Again, kind of like Alexandra Cooper, listening, when I first read the description of this, I'm like, wow, this is going to be, this is going to be terrible, right? Like this, and it is, the podcast is terrible, let's be honest. But I feel like Griffin Johnson's really smart. And I think he got himself into this podcast and was like, what the hell's going on? Because I... Bob's grilling about Griffin's sex life just takes up way too much time in the show. And I feel like Griffin knows that. Um, so I don't know who's arranging the interviews. I don't know who's arranging the guests. I mean, maybe Bob's doing that. And, and that's like his really good contribution to the show. But he needs to stop being obsessed with the sex life of 21-year-old TikTokers. He needs to give that up and focus on the interviews. And, you know, because he's got a great voice. 
I think, you know, the interview that they did, like I said, the interviews they've done were pretty good, but the interaction between them two is really weird and off-putting. Yeah, and and that's the thing is like it's this podcast. I don't even think this podcast knows what it what it's trying to be, right? I agree. Um, I agree because it's, it's all, all over the place. place. And, and, and maybe it, the the idea is like, hey, we're two people who are opposites, which they highlight that a lot. So I think that's probably the theme that they want to go to is that we're you know we're both internet famous, but we're complete opposites otherwise. And just us having a conversation in an interview with somebody. That's the only thing I could really say that this podcast is supposed to be about. So you you know usually you're like, oh. Here's the conceit of the podcast. You're probably drawing a blank on that, right? Yes, so, yes. And to my surprise, there's no ads in the podcast. It's probably because it's very small. They don't have very many episodes. They probably don't have any sponsors yet. And it's um, super new, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it's probably the reason why. And again, I I haven't listened to their other podcasts to see if they're like super ad heavy or whatever, which they may be. I don't know. But kind of taking a step back uh, about sound quality, I just happened to see one of my other notes, <laughs> which was, so I, I, I listened to an earlier episode. I think I listened to episode two. And I had mentioned mm. the sound quality was very bad. And then episode three, the next episode I listened to, the sound quality got worse. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> how is that possible? Well, was episode three the one with the e-boys, the other e-boy they brought in from, um, I think, House Sway or whatever? No, no. The only two I listened to, I, and I, I didn't write down on the episode number because I don't think they have episode numbers. They just have titles. Uh, was yeah. Two Suds and a Simp featuring Tyler Cameron, which is the guy yes, who was on The that Bachelorette. The other... Yeah. And oh, then, Okay. Yeah, and then Killing Osama and Saving Captain Phillips, uh, featuring Robert O'Neill. Now, actually, one, and again, going back to Bob Minry and his, uh, his like his sex, his intrigue with other people's sex life. Um, mm-hmm. He, the Tyler Cameron, he was asking him like, okay, since you've been on the show, like, how much, how many ladies have you been been able to have sex with since the show? And so he does it to this guy as well, <laughs> which is like, yes. why? So. So, okay, so what's interesting is the episode I listened to was Kicking It With The Boys featuring Bryce Hall, which was the, the, the true first episode. And that was one that had the other e-boy from Houseway or whatever. Um, and it was the same thing. The first half of the episode was Bob Minery grilling the two of them about how much sex they have and who they're sleeping with. That was his whole focus. And then he had sort of a freak out because apparently Bryce Hall was uh, smoking weed in the studio. And so Bob Minnery at some point started to get a little paranoid and like freaked out. <laughs> but but again. Like Bob, wait, w- Bob was smoking weed and he got paranoid because he smoked weed? No, no, no. Bryce Hall was smoking weed, but he was getting a secondary hit because they were oh, in the okay. studio or whatever. Okay. And so he was starting, like towards the end, he started getting a little like frantic. and. But, but again, the first half of the episode was talking about sex. And it was mostly Bob asking these two young boys which they sound like boys to me. I mean, I'm in my 40s about how much sex they get. It was so creepy. And so I'm not surprised. I didn't listen to two studs and a simp, but I'm not surprised that that was also about how much, you know, how much action are you getting? Yeah. Um, I listened to Kicking It With The Boys and then the Pokemon Cards and Garage Sales, which is the one with Gary V, which is Gary Vaynerchuk, who's an investment guy. That actually was pretty interesting. And then I did listen to The Killing Osama. So I listened to all the ones except for the two studs and a simp. And I should yeah. note, their last episode was on November 16th. So they were doing weekly pretty much up until that point. So th- I don't know if this has totally failed or if they're on a break for the holidays. I don't know. But yeah, there's a really creepy vibe happening here. So if this continues, my advice to Bob Minery would be stop talking about sex because you're obsessed and it's weird and creepy. <laughs> yeah. And the thing is, it's like you can have a lot of sex talk in a podcast because Sure. And not be terrible because Alexandra Cooper, right? Call me daddy, which, you know, was yes. surprising to us, even though I didn't, I'm not the audience member for that content. Like I'm not the target audience, but I, I saw the merits in that podcast. Right. So exactly. this here is just, it's like, I don't know who would enjoy this. I, I really just, I, I can't, unless maybe you are a dude boy who's in college you know, you're at a party school, you're at the frat house, you know, you're slaying the ladies, you're getting wasted every night, and you love TikTok, then this is the podcast for you. But even then, I don't know if you want to listen to a 35-year-old guy grilling somebody who's like you about how much it's sex true. you're getting. It feels a little <laughs> weird <true>. and creepy. <laughs> it's like you're like your coach being like, hey, let me come hang with you guys because I'm still cool. You know, that's what it feels like. It feels yeah. really... Ugh. Yeah, I, I just feel like somebody needs to take Bob Minery aside and be like, dude, you're 34. It's time to let go, move on, talk about grown-up things. Because the kid, Griffin Johnson, is more mature than you are. Yeah, 
Yeah. And, and part of me, it makes me want to just listen to Bob's other podcast app to see. And maybe it's, it's just, he just is different in the presence of Griffin than he is like mm. on his other podcast. I don't know. And maybe there's some context that's missing, which I, I, I doubt, right? I'm, I'm trying to give some benefit of the doubt to some degree here because, again, these people are internet, you know, internet's famous. They're successful on the internet. They have multiple podcasts, which it seems like the other podcasts are, you know, successful podcasts. So they obviously are doing something right. And it's like, but how, <laughs> you know, and, and to give credit, Griffin, he's probably doing things right because, you know, he's a smart guy. But it's like, Bob, how... You know, it's I, I, I don't know. So maybe I need to listen to this other podcast to try to get some context. Maybe this is just I don't know. Maybe maybe he's putting on an act. So it's like kind of like, again, you know, we talked about it before in the past. Call me daddy where Alexandra Cooper, she, you know, she's she's kind of putting on a character, right? She's uh, yes. performing. And maybe that's what Bob is doing here. Maybe it's some sort of performance that, you know, he's just saying, well, we're two opposites. So I'm going to be this guy who's just trying to relate, you know, kind of like those dads who wear fanny packs who are trying to be hip and cool with their kids and they just embarrass <laughs> them. Right. At, you know, at a park or something. <laughs> like um, on purpose. Yeah. Yeah, it, exactly. It maybe that's maybe that's it. Right. I don't know. So. And I will say that Bob, like if you do a deep dive on his Instagram, his sports commentary videos are hilarious. Like, he is really good at this. Where he does, he sounds exactly like an ESPN announcer. Really kind of crisp, really, really good commentary. But then he throws he throws in these, it's R-rated, but it's also hilarious. Because he's saying what everybody's thinking when they see certain plays or certain things happen on the field. But he has great comedic timing with that stuff. He knows his sports. Like, he's really good in that niche. And I'm going to give him credit for that. Like, if you go and, I, I'm following him on Instagram now because he's hysterical even though I think he's kind of weird and creepy on this podcast, it's possible that that's what he's trying to portray. Like he's supposed to be funny, weird and creepy. Like he's a caricature of the old weird, creepy guy who can't leave the, you know, the, the frat. So maybe that's his shtick and there's just not enough context to grapple with that. I think the problem is if that is his shtick, Griffin doesn't know how to react to it. Yeah. And Griffin's a smart guy. Like I, he reminds me a lot of Alexander Cooper in that this is a young, smart, intelligent man young man who has figured out how to monetize on TikTok, how to handle it professionally. I'm going to invest this money. I'm not going to be irresponsible. This is a kid who knows what he's doing. And I don't know if he's had grooming. I don't know if he's had, like, he's consulting with the right people. But the guy knows what he's doing. But he's his reactions to Bob tells me that those two aren't on the same page about what they're doing. So Bob is, you know, constantly grilling about how much sex he's getting. So he thinks this is supposed to be some sort of dude, bro, let's talk about pussy, whatever type of podcast. Whereas Griffin is not on the same page as to as to what this podcast is supposed to be. So it could be that Bob's trying to play a character. He just hasn't, there's not good communication happening between the two of them, if that's the case. Yeah, yeah. And that's the thing. It's like, if he is playing a character, you would think Griffin would know that and, and learn to right. try to play off it. And again, maybe exactly. comedy is not his thing. Because if, if Bob was playing a character and you had Griffin who had better comedic timing and maybe, you know, to be, you know, maybe he was, he's an actually funny person. The podcast could end up being really funny if you have these two people playing a character of some, you know, Gen Z guy and some boomer millennial um, mm -hmm. and then just playing off each other. But it's almost like Bob's in on the joke, but Griffin's not, right? Yes. And that could be yes. the case. And it makes the podcast very confusing because of that. Yeah. And, and that's why it feels like it comes off creepy because it feels like if that's the character Bob's playing... Griffin's reacting the way someone would actually react to that type of character versus a comedic reaction. So either they're on completely different pages about what this podcast is, which again, may be very possible. And I think that's the most likely explanation. I just think he's a dude bro who hasn't quite let go of his roaring 20s. And he's legitimately funny. He has a real comedic, he has a comedic skill. He's just trying to apply it in a way that isn't working with this other character, this Griffin Johnson guy. And I think whether it's because the two of them are not on the same page or they don't know exactly what they're doing in terms of how this podcast is supposed to work, it just comes, what ends up coming out of it is, this is creepy and weird and why am I listening to it? Yeah, yeah. And I, one of the things I would say is that I definitely have to listen to the other podcasts, right? And, and maybe even Griffin's one of his podcasts. Yeah, the Brand Aid maybe would, might be one that might be interesting. But, you know, Bob, I think I definitely have to listen to Zap to kind, yeah. of, kind of get some more understanding. Because if Bob 
is not like that otherwise, like in his uh, Zap podcast, which I have no idea what even the topic is of that podcast. But if he's not like that, then that tells me that something weird is going on with this podcast or they're still trying to figure it out and they're being very unsuccessful at it. You know, mm-hmm. I, I I agree. I think there's going to have to be some context around it, but it, it's it's going through growing pains right now and I, I can't see it surviving uh, or retaining an audience because, you know, for the reasons you've said, but the fact that the podcast is just all over the place. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think that's fair. And I think maybe that's what we do in an upcoming episode. We review that particular podcast because it might it might give us some context and help us better understand what's going on here. But I think if they want this podcast to continue, they need to get on the same page about what it is. They need to map out who they're going to interview and try to come up with some sort of theme. Because right now, it, like you said, it feels all over the place and there's way too much time spent with their dynamic, which isn't working because either they're not on the same page or they don't have the same like agenda or they're just not compatible. So I guess it's pretty easy to figure out the ratings for this one. I, I definitely hate it uh, personally. Um, and, and it's unfortunate because because there's such polar opposites. It could be great. It right? could be great. It, I mean, it, sound quality aside, they, they got to fix that. They got to fix that too. I mean, let's be honest, it's terrible. But right. uh, if there's the skeleton or the ingredients of a potentially good podcast, but it's just not coming together. And so and hopefully maybe it does one day and we can revisit it. Right. And say, okay, actually it's a lot better now, but yeah. for the meantime, no, I hate it. I won't be listening to more episodes unless for some reason it blows up or something. Yeah, no, I hate it as well. I think it's, it's hard to judge a podcast this early because they're clearly still working out the kinks. I don't think either of them are on the same page as to what this podcast is. The bones are there. And they might have the connections to have the right kind of interviews and the right kind of guests lined up. I, I suspect that's why they're having no episodes right now is because they're probably having a hard time getting their next guests lined up. They just need to figure out, they need to get on the same page. They need to figure out what this podcast is and they need to be more structured about it. And maybe there's something there. Uh, and they definitely need to stop spending half of the episode with Bob begging to hear about the sex life. It just, it, it it's, it's ridiculous. So, I hate it. I have hope that it could be something else because again, and I want to leave on this note, Bob Minery is legitimately funny. Follow his Instagram. He's hysterical. But this podcast is not working the way it's laid out. So the next podcast is The Daily, which uh, I believe is one of the top podcast subscribe podcasts. Uh, it's like, I guess, in the top five. Um, so it's hosted by Michael Barbaro. Uh, he's from the New York times. Uh, he was a journalist until, uh, it looks like it was 2016. Uh, and then he started the podcast, uh, for the New York times. And I believe he's doing this full time because it doesn't look like he's actually doing any like paper or internet journalism type stuff. I think he probably does the podcast full time for the New York times. Um, but he was a journalist for various publications until that point. And the podcast is a daily podcast. Uh, since 2016, so there is a lot, 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 lot of episodes. Because, I mean, literally, it's, uh, I think it is seven days a week. Although the seventh day, they have kind of a, like a special type of episode, which he doesn't necessarily do a whole lot of. But we'll, we'll get into that. And so, of course, you know, you can pretty much watch any episode at any point. Um, although, you know, news, the news cycle so fast, some, some of the things might be old news and not worth listening to. But each episode is typically 30 minutes, uh, sometimes longer than that so it's pretty easily to digest get the day you know your daily dose of news i guess that's why i call it the daily i haven't really ever listened to it because i'm not a big fan of mass media in general and this is comes from the new york times but from my understand Mm -hmm. you do listen to it fairly often is that correct well i did so i first i first found this podcast because when i first got a smart device so now we have on our system we have google home at at home but originally we had the amazon alexa um and so when you initially set up kind of your good morning routine, it gives you an option for news feeds. And it's, you know, I think every major news network has one. Every publication has one. And I picked The Daily from The New York Times thinking, oh, it'll be like the headlines. And and I want to be clear, it's not a re- – so some of those kind of morning news feeds or news podcasts, so to speak, from the various publications and various networks – 
a lot of them are just a recap of the major headlines and the daily is a little bit different. Well, it's a lot different. They do a recap sort of at the end, what you need to know before you leave kind of thing, because it's expected to be this is something you consume in the morning, right? While you're getting ready for work or having your coffee or whatever. And so it's it's not a here's the top five headlines of the day, which some of those are. This is more a, I would say, a supplement to the headlines. It'll be relevant to whatever's currently going on, but it'll be a sort of deep dive or mini deep dive into a particular topic with then at the end of it, kind of a quick recap of the headlines of the day, what you need to know before you leave. Yeah. And um, it looks like on, uh, and they have that, but on Sunday, uh, they have something called the Sunday Read, which uh, I wasn't able to confirm this, but just I listened to one of them and uh, it was the the last Sunday Read they had when I I started listening to the podcast. Uh, it sounds like it's just a narration or like kind of like a audiobook, if you will, of an editorial that is actually appearing in the New York Times. And it's not necessarily Michael who's doing them, right? It's other people who'd be doing right. the Sunday read. I can't, I can't tell. It sounds very professional, so I don't know if these are actual professional readers, at least the one I listen to. Or if it's, you know, the actual person who wrote the article, I'm not sure. But that that's more of like, it's not a lot of news. It's just from an editorial piece. Yeah, I think so a lot of times, and I don't know if it's unique to the Sunday read or if that one's specifically always that, but sometimes even during the week, it'll be like that. So one of the ones I just listened to, which was from Thursday, I think this week, was it was based, so it was narrated by Mike Baker, who's one of the New York Times journalists. So Michael Barbaro kind of introduced it and said, one of our colleagues, Mike Baker, did this story. Wait, and, is, it, is, is that the Mike Baker that's always on Joe Rogan? No. I, oh, I might not be the getting, CIA guy? No, 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 not him. I might be <laughs> oh, getting okay. the name wrong. I may have I may have misstated the name. Oh, who was it? Let me just make sure so I don't... Okay, yeah, the, the most recent episode is the Sunday Read. It was called Something Terrible Has Happened. And yeah, it is Mike Baker, but it's not the one from... It's Seattle Bureau, okay. it's Seattle Bureau Chief for the New York Times. <laughs> Ironically, not the same guy. <laughs> and I would have recognized him immediately if it was because his voice is so unique. But no, it's, it's one of the journalists for the New York Times... And it's specifically, it was a story about um, the Boy Scouts of America is filing for bankruptcy this this year. And it's because they have, I think, around almost 100,000 sexual abuse claims and to the point where it's more than the Catholic Church. So there was this whole story about this one particular victim and kind of it was a deep dive interview with him and his story. But it was Michael Barbaro was, you know, not even part of the podcast. He just introduced it. And then Mike Baker took it and sort of narrated it and then did the interview with this guy. And most of it was this guy telling his story. So I think a lot of the episodes are like that where it's, oh, let's feature this story by this particular journalist. And I think it's highlighting some of the better journalism from The New York Times. That's kind of my impression of the daily. Sometimes it is, let's just talk about this really important news story that's going on right now. And it's a little bit of a deep dive into, you know, whether it's coronavirus or whatever. But each each day, it, it could be a completely story, a story that you wouldn't have even heard if you just looked at the headlines, for example. Yeah. And, and I, I want to correct myself. Uh, the, the, it's Monday through Friday. They don't have one on Saturday. And then they got the Sunday read yes. uh, on Sunday. Yes. So just to clarify that. And I listened to a couple episodes. Now, of course, I listened to it right around the time after the election. So a lot of fodder there for various publications. But put in my notes that it definitely it's it's well produced, right? Um, Oh, for sure. Sound quality is good. It's, you know, got good transitions, uh, the good editing. I mean, and again, it's it's a corporate, you know, it's New York Times. They're they're not amateurs at this kind of stuff. So it was very good. And it's kind of straightforward. Well, let me rephrase that. It's very, it just gets right into whatever they're talking about, right? Yes. It's, there's no frills, no fluff. It's And it kind of tends to be pretty dry, right? Which I, I much rather my news be very dry than, you know, something that you would see on, you know, Rachel Maddow or Sean Hannity or something, which is, you Jesus. know, the opposite of dry. Yep. And from what I could tell is that Michael Barbaro doesn't really offer any opinion. He's more of a kind of the presenter in mm-hmm. a way. And has yet he will have guests on either it could be politicians or uh, whatever the article's about uh, or whatever the, the the topic of the day is about, and he'll have other journalists from uh, the New York Times on there as well, who mm-hmm. kind of report what they're what they've been researching. Mm-hmm. And generally, I don't. I'm always skeptical of just mainstream media in general. Mm-hmm. Nine, I think 99 percent of the mainstream media is not faithful actors to for the American public. So I'm super skeptical in any news information that comes out of corporate media, or at least how it's presented. 
and generally I don't feel like there's a lot of opinion. It does feel like straight journalism. Now, again, I haven't listened to a ton of it. I'm sure maybe there are episodes where there's obviously some kind of bias. Uh, the New York Times is very famous for having bias. But I, I, in the episodes I've seen, I haven't really gotten a feel for that. Now, of course, naturally, they may have some guests on there who are not journalists, mm-hmm. uh, which one of the episodes was The Division Among the Democrats, which is... Yes, that was a great you know, episode. Even though th- that was a good episode because with the election, even though you know it looks like that Trump has lost the election... There was a lot of gains for the Republicans in the in the House, right? In, in a lot of districts, they weren't expecting. And so the Democrats are trying to find who to blame for that. And of course, naturally, you're going to have, you know, senator or uh, representatives and you know Democratic Party officials who are obviously going to be bi- biased, right? But mm-hmm. the journalists who were on that episode, I didn't feel like there was any bias in it, which was kind of surprising to me. Um, and I don't know if that's always the case, but that was something I noticed in uh, that episode I had uh, listened to. I think that's something that's important to note is for me, whenever I listen to anything from any mainstream, mainstream and or otherwise news source is what is their bias? Let me let me know. Let me figure out what their bias is so that I know and I have that perspective as I'm listening to them because it helps kind of judge. It helps you kind of temper your reaction to things and, and to read into what they're telling you. And New York Times is famously very liberal. And honestly, I subscribe to their, I, I get their daily email feed with kind of the headlines and everything. And, and, and I know kind of where their bias lies. And, and I take that into account when I'm reading their articles. But I think the daily is probably, it reminds me, and this is going to sound super, I'm super old and nostalgic, but it reminds me more of 70s kind of the classic era of what we think of when we think of like hard-boiled journalism, 70s, 80s. If you've ever seen the movie, um, well, there's the big short and then there's another movie, oh, Michael Keaton, Spotlight. It, it reminds me of that era of journalism because it's deep dives and it's really an exercise in high quality journalism, right? The real kind of in-depth focusing on one story and digging really deep into that story. Even when it's something that has a great example for me was I was listening to an episode where they were talking about it was a really interesting episode. They were interviewing. He's actually a journalist for the Times and he's an embedded journalist in Afghanistan and he's from Afghanistan. He was raised there. Then he came to the States and went to school in the States and eventually became a journalist for the the New York Times. And then he went over to Afghanistan to do kind of on-site reporting and he's been doing that for a while, but he grew up during the the 90s in Afghanistan when we were there as part of Operation Enduring Freedom, etc. And his perspective was was really really interesting growing up there and and kind of the tenor of the discussion was because I think the reason it was relevant to current headlines, it was right after Trump had announced, you know, we're withdrawing troops from Afghanistan and kind of drawing back, which he's been doing for a while from these these uh, countries. And it was fascinating because the perspective was, is that a good thing or not? Should we be pulling out of these countries? Is it going to create instability? Which is so funny because it was an, I remember this discussion back in the late 90s. Well, it was probably early 2000s, actually, uh, during the Bush administration. Like, should we be pulling out? What's the impact to the region if we do? And so it's a lot of those same kind of considerations. And it was such a good story because he actually went and he met with some of what we classify as terrorists <laughs> about why they're fighting, about why they're doing these bombings. And it was just a really interesting perspective. And again, it's that kind of deep dive, what I consider classic journalism. And that seems to be the common theme among the stories that they pu- publish on the daily. It's not a headlines. Here's the top five things you need to know. Here's what's going on today. The same stuff you get in your inbox from every other publication you're subscribed to. It's, it's as, each episode is a deep dive into a particular topic. It's Wednesday, November 18th. Would you tell me about some of your earliest memories of growing up in Afghanistan? I think some of my earliest memories is my grandpa visiting our home in Kabul often. He lived in a different part of the city and he had a cane. He was a tall man and he loved walking. 
every time he would visit our home and he would knock on the door with his cane, it would be, you know, a moment of joy for us. We would run to the door. But this was a period where the daily reality of the city was just the sound and the destruction of rockets. Mm. And in the house we lived in, we had a small garden where my dad would grow vegetables when he would come back from work. One of those rockets landed as he was watering the flowers and vegetables in the backyard. Wow. And we had this apple tree right in the middle of the backyard. And we're lucky because the rocket kind of cut through that apple tree and it landed and it went through the soft dirt and it didn't explode. Hmm. But I remember very clearly for years after that, my dad would pour water into that spot where the shell had gone in thinking it would rust up the shell and it won't explode. So it almost became part of his backyard garden. And I think it's pretty pretty interesting. It's pretty well done, too. It, it seems like that Michael's also, you know, Barbaro's, he's a pretty good interviewer, it seems like. Although I wouldn't say he grills the people he's interviewed. And again, it could be just that he might not have anybody on a show that he disagrees with kind of thing. So <laughs> yeah, it seemed like it was kind of, I don't want to say softball, but the interview was just, it was more or less just getting information out as opposed to trying to do gotchas. Um, yes. But again, you know, naturally they're not going to want to do that for somebody who you agree with. And I, and that's one thing I wish that in the titles, if they have guests on, that they would have that title, that person of that name in the title. Because the, each episode is like kind of just, it's almost like a headline, right? When the pandemic came to rural Wisconsin, yes. a day at the food pantry, a failed attempt to overthrow the election. It's just, it, so it's kind of like, uh, like headlines, but... You know, if they're interviewing people, I wish, and of course, naturally, I probably just go to the show notes and they might have that information in there. But I wish if they had a guest on that, they would have that person in the title. So I can just kind of scroll through and pick out if let's say, for example, you know, if they have AOC on there, I can probably understand how they're going to interview her, right? How the nature of the interview is going to be and versus if they had like a Dan Crenshaw on, I want to see how they do it to, you know, how the interview goes with somebody like that. And again, that's kind of one of those things where, you know, you have to try to figure out the bias. It's like, how do they treat different people from different sides of the aisle? And so I haven't been able to find a, uh, an episode like that, that kind of tells me that there's, because I, I want to find out the bias, right? Because I, I don't notice it in the few episodes I listen right. to. And because I'm just so naturally skeptical, I need to find something where I, you know, I need some kind of litmus for the, to find out where the bias is. And because of that, I just, I can't really, I don't like how the episodes are titled in that way. They take kind of an artsy approach to the titles of the episodes. Like the one that I just listened to regarding the Boy Scouts was called Something Terrible Happened. I had no idea what it was about. It's just Something Terrible Happened, which was a quote from the guy who was a victim of abuse. So they're very poignant titles. They're artsy titles. They would what maybe you would title a book yeah. if you were writing a story about this particular item. So I, I get what they're doing. I think you're very kind of give me the facts, give me the information. I don't want a lot of fluff. So I think that's why the titles are yeah, frustrating yeah, you. That's, that's a good point. <laughs> but if you listen to it every day, if you're somebody who is a regular subscriber, the titles mean less and they're a little more uh, color. Ooh, what's this about? You know, but you're going to listen to the episode. So I, I think it depends on how you consume it. If it's something where as you're getting ready every morning, you're listening to the daily, and then the title, in retrospect, you can look back on the title and go, oh, I know what that's about. I will say... <sighs> I've picked up on the bias. I listen for the bias because I want to know where is my news information coming from. I want to understand their perspective because that colors greatly the information. It's not like I'm not going to listen. I'm not going to believe the information because of a certain bias. Like I can listen to something from Fox News. I know where their bias is. Uh, the Daily Wire, I know where their bias is. The MSNBC, CNN, you know, like I know where all of their bias is. And I know where the New York Times' bias is. But I will say this particular production has a lot less of that. There is, I've picked it up in a couple of places. For example, the episode I was just talking about um, where they interviewed uh, this journalist who's been embedded in Afghanistan. It was a fascinating interview and it was incredibly valuable perspective. At the beginning, there was a little bit of President Trump has said he's going to withdraw troops. Here's why we think that's bad. Right. And, and okay. That's the perspective, which I thought was really interesting, actually. I thought that was, for a second, I was like, wait, is this 
this is the New York Times? Because <laughs> that didn't seem like a very liberal perspective, right? And, and I, I expect a little bit of a liberal bias from the New York Times. And I thought, wow, this sounds more like a John McCain kind of Republican hawk perspective. So I was really kind of intrigued. So I think they aren't, they aren't tied, at least for the perspective of this particular podcast and this feed. I think they pick their stories. And I think there's a lot less bias here than there are in their headlines which is one of the reasons I find a lot of value in it because I'm seeing different perspectives. That episode you talked about where they interviewed AOC and um, the uh, the Democrat from Pennsylvania. I'm not, I can't remember his name right now. Anyway, it was it was that whole discussion about the leaked, uh, the leaked conference call, Dem- Democratic Party conference call, where they were talking about, we're not going to use the word socialism. They were sort of trying to distance themselves from the progressive narrative because they felt like it hurt them during the elections. And then they interviewed AOC to get her perspective. And then she kind of leveled some accusations against another Democratic candidate. And then they had him on. And it was a really, to me, that was like peak, really good New York Times journalism. Here's the story, which is this leaked call. Here's somebody from somebody from that kind of progressive part of the liberal uh, or the Democratic Party, AOC, and her perspective on it. And then here's somebody from the more kind of traditional, classical liberal side of the party and his perspective on it, right? Because he's in a different district. He's in a district where some of these things that the, the progressives are saying are going to hurt him. Whereas she's in a district where it's primarily progressive. That's why she's getting voted in. And so it was a really interesting dichotomy between these two Democratic Party members and it was good journalism. And that's the thing I, t- I took away from this is that this is, it feels kind of like that old school, really good journalism. And so I think there's really good value here. Yeah, you need to understand their bias, but it's good journalism. It speaks very loud, you know, it speaks volumes to how I've talked about mainstream media, like how you know critical I am of it, how wary of it I am, how suspicious I am and skeptical. And it tells you the state of the media to where I immediately have that stance. Right. Right. And right. so th- and that's a very sad statement where, like you said, this, you know, there's some really good hard hitting information in there. But I know that New York Times is biased, just like, you know, people would say Fox News is biased. Right. It, it doesn't matter. There's yep. bias yep. there. And the New York Times has proven over and over again that there's bias. And I'm just because of the history of the New York Times, it, it kind of ruins the potential of this being good because of that reason, because I'm already so skeptical of it. And it's hard for me to listen to it with any grain of salt to think, OK, they're, they're reporting this because there's some ulterior motive. And that may be a mistake on my part and that may be a flaw on my part. But that's just how the media has gotten so crazy, uh, crazy partisan that it's like I feel like I can't really trust any of it. Yeah. And it's it's painful because <sighs> Part of me really, and I think it's just because I'm I'm old and nostalgic, but part of me really yearns for a newspaper that I can open up, shake the pages, and sit there and read it and be like, this is great journalism happening. You know, <laughs> it's just, there's not so much of that anymore because it's all so clickbaity and it's also inflammatory. Like the whole point is, let me make you angry. Let me, let me get you fired up about this or make you react in a certain way. And there's just a weird manipulation that happens in the media. It's probably been going on forever, but I think that's one of the reasons I really like this specific podcast slash newsfeed, whatever you want to call it, is that it's, I feel like it's really, it's kind of a throwback because there's not a lot of room for bias in it. There is bias and you have to pay attention and you have to understand where the bias is coming from. And I do, I, I know it's New York Times, 99% of their journalists are very, very liberal and they have a very liberal stance. And I think understanding that's important, but at the same time, it is possible for somebody with a bias to still do good journalism and produce good journalism. And I think the Daily really highlights some of the best of the New York Times journalism. I think this story, a great example is a story about the Boy Scouts. There's no bias here. There's no bias. It's not a political story. And they've done plenty of stories that are not necessarily political stories where it's just good journalism being done well. And even when there, it is a political story, you can understand that there is a lean to the left or to the right in a story. But if it's done well, they might favor and speak more favorably of one side or the other. But you still kind of get the meat and you still kind of get right. the right information. And I think this is, to me, this is as close as you can get to that. Like, And again, like I said, I subscribe. I have New York Times. I get daily emails. 
I read the headlines, and I know where they're coming from. It's one of many right. that I get and I consume. And uh, I feel like this is the shining star from the New York Times. I, when I read their headlines, it's grossly biased it, to the point that it's almost comical. It's, it's, the, it's the opposite of Fox News. You read Fox News, it's, it's the same sort of comical, grossly biased, oh, it's, you know, Trump good, everybody else bad. On the New York Times, Trump bad, everybody else good. You know, it's, it's very black and white what they're doing. But right. this particular podcast, the journalism is a little different, and I really appreciate it. And again, this is kind of a fault of mine is that, you know, it, it, the the story about the Boy Scouts, I, I probably need to listen to that one because that does sound oh, very good. interesting. Yeah. But I know that from, it, it, I'm very into the meta of the mainstream media, even though I hate it and I'm skeptical of it. I mm-hmm. I'm inundated within that meta of their bias. And... I know that a lot of these people who live in these cities from their, these journalists from their ivory towers have hated the Boy Scouts for years, right? Mm-hmm. And it's probably almost with glee that they're reporting the story. And so I immediately take that uh, position that they're, they're probably excited that this will mean the end of the in, end of the Boy Scouts because they've been wanting to get rid of it for years. It, part of me, I'm already getting it going into it with a bias that's against them. So, you know, well. and that's not fair to them, but I will say... Even, you know, because I saw, oh, this is New York Times, there's going to be some bias. And so I started listening to the podcast. I didn't recognize it. And so it's almost like I'm now hunting for the skeleton in the closet, in a sense. Uh, You know, I'm hunting for that bias and I can't find it, which other than where you would expect there to be bias. Again, if you're going to have an interview with AOC, you're going to expect bias, right? From her. Right. Well, you expect her political perspective. Right. Exactly. She's where she is. Yeah. 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 That's fine. You know, Uh, I don't have any problem with that. And it's so it's one of those things where I think I need to listen to it more because I already have such a high level of distrust going into it that it has to it has to earn my respect. And it, and I haven't listened to it enough for it to do that yet. So I still remain skeptical of it. And I think that particular episode, the one something terrible happened, the one about the Boy Scouts, I think that's a great one to start with. So I didn't even I didn't even realize that there was a we don't like the Boy Scouts thing. Like I didn't realize that was a thing that was going oh, on in oh, like, from it is. political it is perspective. For years. But there, I, oh, and, and again, I could be naive, but I didn't detect any of that because it's very bare bones. It's, uh, there's this many suits against, or there's this many cases against the Boy Scouts, 92,000, which is more than the Catholic Church. And then it just progresses straight into, here's this one man's story. And whether or not there's a bias behind that, this man's story was true and it was heartbreaking. It was so well told and so well constructed. It was literally just a story about one guy. It has, it, in the greater context of there's 92,000 cases, they make no discussion about what the state of those cases are. Oh, and the Boy Scouts are filing bankruptcy partially because of this. But they make no kind of connection between this story and that. Like, the like they don't say these are 92,000 proven cases or they, you know, it's just there's that many cases against the Boy Scouts. Here's this one man's story. And his perspective. And it was literally all it's, it's all it was, was just his perspective. And even he was talking about his son wanting to join the Boy Scouts and how, when he heard up, when he first asked him, he said, no. And then he went and threw up in the bathroom, you know, like, and, and his wife convinced him to let him do it, but we'll be real careful and we'll watch and see what's happening. And it gave you the, it, it literally was just the story about this one, this one man's experience. Right. And whether that's good or bad for the Boy Scouts, so be it. It, it, it. There was no, to me, there was no proclamation about Boy Scouts equals bad. It was, this is this one guy's experience. And, and that's why right. I appreciate it. Like, even if there was an agenda, so to speak, about, oh, the Boy Scouts are bad for whatever other reason, all I got was information and facts. Right. And this one man's perspective. So it sounds like there was no hyperbole. I probably need to listen no, to that No, not then, at all. But- so and that is that and that's refreshing. And if, it, like I said, you've had way more exposure to the daily than I have. So yes. it, it, if that seems to be the trend, then that's very refreshing, especially seeing from the New York Times. Mm-hmm. Um, and something that would need to, I, I wish, or the organizations would take that stance, or at least make their bias clear. <laughs> that would be nice, you know. Pull the tin pool and always iterate every single sentence where you, where you are politically. Um, <laughs> But it's one of those things I got to listen to. But it's it's almost part of me is again it's it's mainstream media which it, it, I don't partake in in general. And you're right to be skeptical, right? Because 
the whole point of media these days, is, in mainstream media, is to manipulate you and to get you to click. And so whatever they got to do, however they got to spin it. And right now, the popular option is to go liberal or, or anti-Trump, we'll say. Like, you know, if you go anti-Trump, you're guaranteed to get clicks and, and lauding and whatever. But the New York Times, and I have a real hard time with this because I really value classic journalism and the New York Times the gray lady is one of one of the most upstanding it's up there with the post and there's, you know there's five or six kind of major newspapers that have the history of being the ones that broke things like Watergate and real real journalism and I think those days unfortunately are kind of gone um, and I'm not saying that even in the 70s and 60s and and, and the days of what I consider sort of classic journalism, investigative journalism, even though the landscape has changed and it's all about sensationalism and it's all about manipulation. It's all about click, 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 because paper is dying, which I think has, I think, honestly, I think the internet and the availability of information, true or false, has killed classic yeah. journalism. It, like it's yeah. almost dead. It's, it's, it's yeah. breathing its dying breaths. And so anytime you get a gasp of the real thing still out there, it's it's so valuable. Yeah. And I mean, I read the headlines of the New York Times and I'm like, come on, you guys are being well, super, you're being the exact same clickbaity as Fox News, MSNBC. You're, you're acting exactly like every other and it's gross because you're in the New York Times. You should be doing better. You yeah. should be, you know, it, it disappoints me because I... I have this romantic ideal of what the New York Times and the Washington Post and all these of what they are, and they're not that anymore. And so when something like this comes along, the Daily, it feels like the right kind of journalism. It feels like the old school journalism, like just give me the information, tell me a story that's based on truth. Yeah. And you got to know what their bias is, but it's not it's not in your face in these stories. And and some will say, oh. You got to pay attention then because it's being subversive. It's 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 there, but it's like it's it's romancing you into a, a an idea and a, and maybe that's true. But for me, you know, when you listen to a man pouring his heart out about his sexual abuse experience in the Boy Scouts, that's a real person. That's a real experience, and there's nothing painted on it. It's right. just him telling his story. That's it. Right. Or the story of this guy who was raised in Afghanistan. He's now a journalist. He's a journalist. But all he's telling you is what his experience was and about his interviews with these these terrorists and why they're doing what they're doing. And it doesn't, it doesn't tell you to have a specific conclusion. A New York Times headline, like you get their daily emails, it tells you this is what you should think, which I don't like. I don't like that about journalism. I like, here's the story. What do you think? And that's what the daily feel is, feels like to me. It feels like, here's the story. What do you think? It feels like it's 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 ending in a question mark. And it's just, it's, I love it. <laughs> this is, you know, you mentioned the internet, how it's kind of affected journalism. And, you know, it, especially things like Twitter. I think Twitter has probably been the biggest uh, drain on modern journalism because they just kind of, it's, they just kind of talk to each other in this it. echo chamber <laughs> and they write stories based in this echo chamber. Yes. And it, it's, I feel like, it's, yeah, Twitter has ruined journalism essentially because 90% of all the yeah. verified check marks on Twitter are journalists, right? So there's been a lot of times where they mm -hmm. literally will, it, it's almost like if you ever play a game of telephone. Oh, yeah. Right? It, it that happens on Twitter, and uh, entire articles are written with incorrect data simply because of this game of telephone that happens on uh, Twitter. So, and that and that's one of the beauties of the internet. Which while there's bad things, again, a lot of these, like you said, a lot of these people, a lot of these companies will write articles with headlines to get even hate clicks because oh, hate yeah. click is still a click, sure. right? It still earns you money. The beauty of the internet, though, is that you get, and especially podcasts, is that. It really gives the independence, mm -hmm. the people outside of corporate me uh, news media, they can have a voice and they can actually talk and actually do reporting because they either one, they felt constrained by right. working for these big publications or they, they themselves don't like the bias because, you know, you talk to people who've worked for a lot of these companies, they say, hey, you have to write with a bias, right? And yeah, you've heard they, they don't like that. You've heard many, many, st sorry, you've heard many stories of, of journalists who have left or have been driven out because they were told 
you must write about this or you must, you know, change your story to be yes. this. And they're well, like, no, I don't want to do that. Case case in point, Barry Weiss, she resigned from the New York Times. Yeah. And she wrote a resignation, resignation letter that's on her website that went viral. Yeah. And it paints the New York Times in a very, very poor light. It mm-hmm. pretty much confirms any suspicions of impropriety at the New York Times. And mm-hmm. it confirms my own skepticism of the New York Times as a whole. Right. So it, it just reinforces that. And so, I, and I think we've kind of digressed from about the content of the daily itself, but, you know, that that's, I want to kind of frame it as a whole that this is still a mainstream news podcast. So even though we say, you know what, it, it feels like it's hard hitting journalism. It seems like it's really well done journalism, but here is the history of the New York Times keep that in mind as you listen to it yeah you can't you can't divorce this from the new york times which is why i think it's important to discuss that because this is a product of the new york times and again i go back to you know and and i've heard there's plenty of stories from journalists both within the new york times as well as those who used to work there that there is a very clear agenda and if you stray from that agenda you will be ousted and or you'll be ostracized and that's unfortunate. It's sad, I, but it's true of every main. Like to your point, it's it's true of every mainstream media organization, whether it's papers, whether it's news channels, whether it's news organizations, whether it's you know. That's why I don't trust any of them. Internet news, <laughs> yeah, I, I, they all have bias. They all have an agenda. They all have, you know, a structure, which is one of the reasons I think the daily itself is is kind of this weird, refreshing... It is a product of the New York Times, but it doesn't feel like it's pushing an agenda. I, And I'm not naive. Like I said, I get, I get daily emails from multiple different publications and networks, and each of them have their own spin, and the New York Times has a very, very specific spin. Every single article headline you can read and go, okay, you know, you, you can see it. It's very in your face, as all of them are. But what I like about the daily is it, it narrows in. It's like it's it's like a microscope. It narrows into a specific story within the story, like a specific person. And it just lets you hear their story without commentary. There's no comment. There's very little or no commentary from either the journalist or from Michael Barbaro. Now, there's some exceptions. There's definitely been times where there's more commentary from the journalist, right, from whoever's writing the article. But when it's not is when it's when it's at its most golden is when yeah. I'm not I'm not a journalist commentating on this. I'm just letting you listen to this person tell their story. That's when it's the most valuable to me. Is don't tell me how to feel about the story. Just give me the story. And they yeah. do that more often than most news organizations. And and I'm I'm not talking about the Times in general. I'm talking about specifically this podcast. And it's why I still hold out a little bit of hope for the Times. They've fallen victim to the same problem that every single news organization has fallen victim to, which is we must have clicks. We must identify who our tribe is and we must appeal to them. Right. Well, as, as Barry Weiss puts it, Twitter has become its ultimate editor. Yes, exactly. Exactly. And it makes me sad. <laughs> like when I was listening to this, I take joy in what it delivers because it's like this last little vestige of just tell the story. Don't tell us how to feel about the story just tell the story and i wish i wish there was more of that in journalism today and this is like this one little shining light and again maybe the choice of the stories they're telling are have some sort of bias and i'm t- i'm sure they do but it's still a true story and they're not telling me how to feel about it for the most part there's a few exceptions but for the most part it's just here's the story and it's just so refreshing I just wish I wish there was more journalism like this. And, you know, as far as rating goes, I give it a skeptical don't hate it. Um, more information. <laughs> you don't hate needed. it, but you don't trust it. Yeah, I, I don't hate it, but I don't trust it. Exactly. Um, yeah. And to be honest, I mean, and that probably speaks to why it's one of the top podcasts in the world. Right. I think it is in the top five. Right. Most. Subscribed. I think so. Well, also also it's like. One of the top ones recommended in like the Google Home and Alexa. Right, so right. I think that helps its 
its numbers a bit. <laughs> right. So it's kind of like when in India, when you get a new Android phone, it automatically subscribes you to T series, <laughs> you know, on YouTube. Um, yeah, exactly. So, but uh, yeah, I don't. I, I'm skeptical of it still. I, I need to listen to it more. But it, from what I've heard so far, it, it is like you said, a, brain, a shining star within you know the the darkness that is the New York Times and mainstream general <laughs> as a whole. I definitely would recommend it, but still just keep it within context that this is still the New York Times. Yeah, I think it's always wise to know the bias of the organization that's producing any news that you listen to, whether it's a person or or an organization or a, a media conglomerate. But I think this is an example of the kind of journalism that the New York Times is capable of. I think they fall victim to the trap that is inevitable for every news source these days, which is you must choose a side, do so, and adhere only to that side. I think their print media still does that, but I think the Daily is this rare exception where they focus on telling stories with less focus on telling you how to feel about that story. And so for me, it's I, I definitely don't hate it. I would venture to the side of I love it. I would say, as you said, be aware of where it's coming from, as in anything that you consume, understand the context. But for me, I I do love it. I will continue to listen to it and subscribe to it. I probably don't listen to it every single day, cause just because I have a lot of podcasts I listen to. <laughs> but to me, it it has value. And I think it's, I want to support it because I feel like it's one of the very few examples of of news media that is just giving you the information, letting you make decisions. Um, it, the choice of the information they're giving you is narrow, which could have its own bias. But again, I think everything that I've listened to has had value. So um, yeah, I don't hate it. Have thoughts you want to share? Send us an email at whyihateyourpodcast at gmail.com or visit our website at whyihateyourpodcast.com. You can also find us at Hate Your Podcast on Twitter and Instagram. Our intro, transition, and outro music is by Kevin McLeod and licensed under Creative Commons. Please see the show notes for details.